Um, hello, everybody. I'm actually uh, welcoming you from Palo Alto today. And, and just word about myself. I've been in, in the Valley for like 35 years and doing all kinds of different things. Uh, uh, but the biggest success that I have is raising a proper kids. I guess that they're, they outdid me uh, by hundredfold when it comes to success. But uh, nevertheless, um, I'm kind of in tune with every change that is happening here on a daily basis, and I'm very really happy to uh, to moderate the panel today with the Pat and Nisa and Jeremy. Um, and uh, what what I would suggest that we do, we just uh, we, we get the the role of of people that that are the panelists, and I, I let everybody to introduce themselves and kind of like uh, tell tell the major of the topics that. Uh, that that it, it's concerning the NFTs and and the crypto today, and then we'll navigate. And I'm pretty sure that we will learn uh, quite a big few things. We had this panel last week, uh, a few days ago, uh, I'd say, um, in Miami, and and I know it, it raised a lot of interest from from within the audience. So um, let, let's start with with Pat, and then why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? Thank you, Arthur. Hi, everyone. Uh, Pat Levetti, I'm the CEO of Oasis Pro Markets. Uh, what Oasis Pro Markets is, is a registered broker dealer with, the, um, with an ATS for digital securities. We are um, the only ATS to our knowledge that's been um, registered for digital cash or digital currency for digital securities transactions, which means stable coins for digital securities um, and, and the expansion of that as the regulators allow. Uh, we are launching at the end of Q1 of uh, 2022 with a number of issuers. And uh, one of the benefits is atomic swaps, et cetera. And, and um, one of the reasons Marty asked me to be on this is that uh, we're also in the NFT space, specific, specifically fractionalized NFTs that uh, may be deemed security. So we're spending a lot of time with NFT companies um, if, if they are deemed securities regarding potential listings. And just a quick snapshot of my background, uh, 25 plus years uh, investment banking at uh, Credit Suisse and Bear Stearns, JP Morgan, where I ran several groups and uh, got into the crypto space about uh, four years ago. And I have a major DeFi player as a partner, uh, which is the uh, uh, the senior um, uh, senior um, uh, management team from uh, a DeFi project called uh, MakerDAO. So um, that's uh, that's Oasis. Thank you. Go, go ahead, Nisa. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Nisa Amoyles. I'm a venture capitalist. I um, have been in venture capital for the past 10 years and the past five exclusively investing in blockchain and crypto companies. Uh, prior to that, uh, securities and corporate lawyer. Uh, and I've also uh, worked for uh, different media outlets at, at various times, kind of trying to educate and report on digital assets. And uh, currently, I run a fund called A100X, uh, which invests in blockchain-enabled businesses solving real problems, uh, including tokenized real-world assets that I've been investing in for a while. And then also an advisor to Dragonfly Capital, uh, which seeded MakerDAO and now Rune has joined us. Um, so uh, see both sides of um, digital assets from crypto to NFTs to DeFi to uh, enterprise blockchain and uh, happy to be here again. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Jeremy, you with us? I am, and I and I just want to apologize ahead of time. Uh, severe weather, so flights got delayed, and I should have been uh, in a stable location, but on the road. So I did want to call in. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. I uh, really appreciate it. Jeremy Bourne, CEO and co-founder of a NFT production company and marketplace called NFT Genius. Uh, I've been in crypto since about 2016, seen all the ups and downs, got into the NFT space very early, decided to get my feet wet by starting a project called Bitcoin Origins, which was 
the first time anybody had really brought storytelling as an element into the NFT space. And we effectively had a scarce collection of artistic cards on the Wax blockchain uh, that basically told the story of Bitcoin from the inception of the white paper to where we are today. That made several million dollars to attract the likes of people like Mark Cuban, Anthony Pompliano, Roham, CEO of Dapper Labs, uh, that filled out our seed round. From there, we uh, launched several other projects across three additional blockchains, sold out across those. And now that's led to where we are today, which is a partnership with Dapper Labs, um, the makers of NBA Top Shot, one of the most successful sets in history, uh, giving us first access to the Dapper wallet, making it really easy for anybody to come in and spend uh, you know, with fiat currency and credit cards to be able to purchase NFTs. We launched our Gaia marketplace on the Flow blockchain, kicked off with our own internal IP called Ballers. That sold out immediately and now it's become an international phenomenon and we haven't even opened the secondary markets yet. So we're in the midst of uh, actually closing out here our A round um, through all the interest we've you know received through this and just really excited to be here and, and uh, share my knowledge. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Jeremy. And then wh what are we saying on you, Jeremy, uh, you, since you wrote the white paper uh, on, on the Bitcoin in general, any chance, <laughs> that, you know, a, a lot of a lot of people out there, they're there, there's, you know, they hear NFT, but they have they're clueless, right? What, what that really is. Any chance that you could, like, in a in couple of minutes, explain to our audience of what what the NFT is? and you know how one derives a, an object of a nft and then it turns it into security uh yeah sure i'll give my best shot i'm sure some other folks on here would would give a good answer as well just being in the industry so long um from my perspective uh coming from digital marketing and, and media for some of the biggest brands in the world i understood as soon as I saw NFTs, the writing was on the wall day one, as soon as uh, some of the largest brands in the world came into the space and, and started selling these NFTs. So the easiest way that I like to explain it is if you think about, if you're a collector of traditional sports cards, let's just say, you know, Fleer cards, um, Upper Deck growing up, I collected a lot of those as well. That entire industry is now moving on to the blockchain. And what does that do? Well, it gets rid of any potential counterfeit because you can prove unequivocally that the asset that you own, that NFT, that digital representation of that trading card is tied to the blockchain. You can verify ownership immediately. It's immutable. It can never be changed. And with that, not only are you collecting a collectible, but it also has the ability to do a lot more. I think of these as mini supercomputers. You can program them to do whatever you want. So unlike a card that deteriorates over time, now the new version of collectibles is such that you can provide access to things. It can be tied to a physical object that gives you access. We will see, and we're starting to see inklings of people tying this into real estate. I see a future where this is tied to deeds and the deeds that you hold is actually an NFT um, because it gives you access to immediate information or access to different things as well. Um, so that being a non-fungible token comparatively to a fungible token, that is the main difference. Um, you know, one Bitcoin, there's a specific denomination of a Bitcoin, you know, to the equivalent of, you know, X amount of dollars at any given time. But a non-fungible token, there's no one-to-one -one, uh, derivation necessarily, right? Because there is an artistic element to it. So it is almost what people are willing to pay for. It derives its value. Got it. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm learning and, and I'm really fascinated by it. Uh, anybody else uh, on the panel would like to t toss in their definition uh, on simplifying, simplifying the, the understanding what the, what the NFT is on top of it, and then we'll go and move on to other um, other areas. I think Jeremy gave a great definition. In summary, I would say it's really uh, a primitive, um, and it it's something that provides you a certificate of authenticity to an object or rather property rights in what we create or, or the internet of value uh, that we're creating. It, just to summarize, it's um, right now it's manifesting mostly in art, uh, but it's going to manifest in other areas as well. Just, just to add to that in regards to uh, real world assets. So think of a commercial property building or a residential building with cash flows and uh, uh, we've been approached by several uh, real estate groups regarding uh, uh, 
uh, utilizing NFTs as a uh, methodology to uh, raise capital and fractionalizing those particular properties into an NFT where the cash flows, the contracts, um, the, um, it, you know, if there's an HOA, all that documentation is built into the smart contract and easily accessible. Great. Well, um, Nisa, since uh, so I'm kind of like taking the role, I just wanted to know what what is the specific like the the the, the, the project that you're working on right now that may be of interest to to, to the audience. So it's not a project; it's a fund that invests in companies like Jeremy's company. Uh, so we seeded Dapper Labs back in 2018. Um, in, in other areas of NFTs, uh, we're investing in the infrastructure there um, as it relates to gaming or the metaverse or these other areas. Those, those are what the fund invests in. Uh, and Pat, um, let's say if, if I wanted to secur sec securitize some uh, idea and, and then I wanted to issue my own N NFT, where do I go? Um, well, let me just say, uh, Nisa and Jeremy are in the fun part of this whole area. We're in the regulated area, so we deal with FINRA, the SEC, so it's not quite as much fun, but uh, for, some, for some it is. So you would go to a group like ourselves, a uh, broker-dealer, in regards to um, establish and, and a um, smart contract developer like a consensus which is, you know, if you want to be on the Ethereum blockchain, for instance. And um, with your attorneys, you would uh, develop what the smart contract would be in regards to all the documentation that needs to be in the, in, in, in the NFT. I'm saying smart contract, but I mean it in the NFT. Um, and it's bespoke uh, to um, the earlier comments. It is uh, unique, uh, but from a securitization standpoint, that's, Fractionalization, which is uh, relatively new uh, um, to the um, to the NFT space regarding real world assets, but that's the beginning blocks. And then to raise the capital, uh, you know, the uh, the issuer can can raise the capital themselves or utilize a broker dealer such as ourselves. Where we we come into the picture is in regards to listing. We have an ATS. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, been approved by FINRA and uh, overseen by FINRA and the SEC, where you can think of an ATS, which is an alternative trading system, as uh, an exchange with, but, uh, but not on a national market basis. So you could list there and offer your holders of the fractionalized NFT the opportunity to liquidate if they so choose with an active market. So we're thinking about incorporating automated market makers into our APS and other components of DeFi as well. Thank you. Uh, Jer Jeremy, uh, uh, so so would you be the, the actual link uh, between the securitization and then and an actual, you know, converting a, a proper assets uh, to, to be ready for, for listing? Yeah. Um, in essence, you know, that can all be enabled through our marketplace technology. Um, that's on Gaia.com where we will be launching several different large brands, athletes, musicians, and their NFTs. And one can assume in the future that is also comprised of regulated assets. Um, so we provide the secondary market functionality and the ease of use for somebody to be able to buy, sell, and trade in that ecosystem all built on flow and utilizing the adapter walls. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, but maybe let, let me go back a little bit to Patrick. I, I, like, let, let's say uh, there, there's a music company out of Los Angeles, right? And then what, what is it that... Um, that needs to be done to convert a catalog of, of uh, uh, you know, the of, of music uh, catalog or, or, or library of films to be converted into the NFT. Uh, you need to have a specialized lawyer and then you, you come to your, your firm, uh, pa pa Patrick? 
Yeah, uh, <clears throat> that's right. And when, when you say a music library, royalties, both entertainment as well as uh, um, for music is a logical step for NFTs. Uh, you build, again, uh, you build the product category that you that you would want, potentially working with Jeremy's group or, or others in regards to the coding, uh, where, you, you know, we're talking about marketplaces, et cetera, but uh, at the end of the day, this is all coding, uh, building the NFT, and then, um, and then uh, looking, you know, and then raising the capital. You can do that through a marketplace. We actually have a primary listing marketplace as well to raise the capital. And um, we, which is to, um, from a security standpoint called the private placement. And th this is where NFTs are going when they're fractionalized and incorporating real world assets. There's still a very gray area in regards to um, um, uh, uh, artistic works at this point in time, in regards to potentially some of the areas uh, Nisa and Jeremy are in. There's still a, a gray area regarding fractionalization and whether it is a security. Um, but when it, when it comes to real world assets, it would be. So yes, going through that process, uh, selecting a broker dealer and then an ETS like ourselves. So there's on the equities market right now, there's a New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. If you want to go down that route, you would have similar types of uh, choices on the ATS front. Oasis Pro Markets is uh, one of them. and. Uh, we uh, we think we're one of the best, uh, but uh, there would be choices out there. And then you have a listing venue, and once it's listed, um, it's there's also exemptions because of the private placement. Depending on those exemptions, then uh, you know the trading and who's allowed to invest in it. Those are all regulated here in the U.S. by uh, a, a, a whole set or code of rules. Like I said earlier, this is not the fun part of NFTs. But but is it is it going to cost a, a client, let's say, hundreds of thousands of dollars to to get the paperwork prepped? Um, well, uh, let's see. Uh, you know, I think it, it depends on the size and who your attorneys are. But uh, I think uh, in regards to listing fees, they're relatively low. Uh, in comparison to public entities, or it's less than 100,000, sometimes less than 25,000. So the mm -hmm. listing fees are not egregious. The ATSs um, um, charge for trading, similar to uh, uh, the old days when you would trade, you would get charged a fee. All ATSs charge fees for both the uh, buyer and the seller. So there is a component of that as well. But from the issuer standpoint, the listing fees are less than 100000 My guess is for uh, private placement documentation, depending on your attorney, it could range uh, at the very low end, probably around twenty twenty five thousand. So, I mean, we're not we're not really talking big numbers here. Right. Um, Nisa, so so tell me about your firm more more. So I better understand, like, uh, what is it that that you, you're doing right now? Because I'm. Uh, it, it's 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 a new territory to me. I'm I'm, I'm getting better at it, but I really wanted to know. Uh, you you raising the, the 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 capital right now, or or where where what stage are you in? Um, so it's it's on fund three. Um, we're 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 in the process of raising fund three. Um, launched a hedge fund as part of the uh, overall umbrella of products and. Um, is a global uh, fund with offices in Singapore, West Coast, and New York. So yeah, it's basically high level. So, so what are the examples of, of say, uh, NFTs that that you've you've found that so far, or, or there are there such? Yeah, uh, there's a company called TR Lab that uh, we incubated that basically is in NFT art world. Um, Obviously, the fund owns NFTs outright um, and, and sometimes trades them too. Uh, but it's mostly looking at infrastructure surrounding um, NFTs and gaming. Like Mythical Games is a blockchain based gaming company um, investing in that just raised uh, at a, over a billion valuation, for instance. So, so there's a lot of that as well. Wow, well, that, that's quick. <laughs> from, from zero to a billion, I guess. 
Um, uh, Jeremy, any exciting uh, projects that, that you can share with us uh, that uh, in NFT, uh, NFT world? Yeah, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Probably the last thing I'll be able to say before I lose reception completely. Um, yeah, there's some very interesting plays happening right now. You're seeing, you know, some of the biggest brands in the world coming in, most notably something like Adidas has come in recently and partnered with a company called Pixel Vault, who has created Punk's comic in the Meta Hero universe. Uh, they're working with CA and some very large firms like Fenwick to be able to create DAOs, uh, which are decentralized autonomous organizations, which effectively the community and the bearers of the NFTs, the holders themselves, uh, have part and say in terms of the future of that particular project. They also issue tokens, uh, have staking mechanisms, and they just partnered with Adidas to bring the Punk's comic universe into the metaverse. So it's really interesting to see what's happening, even, you know, things like Ballers and uh, the recent success we've had, you know, we're in talks with, you know, several large organizations and, and we see ourselves filling a gap, which is, you know, NBA Top Shot proved that the average person would come in and, and buy a lot of sports cards. And there's tremendous interest there to the tune of over $700 million in revenue. Um, we actually built the first real PFP for sports fans and it just went, you know, absolutely bananas. Um, with that said, now we're speaking with organizations who want to get in. They want to get involved uh, from the NBA to several other organizations who now want to enter the space with their likeness of the athletes as well as their brands. Uh, they really want to dip their toe in, in a significant way and they want to partner with brands that have been here uh, and have you know, a proven track record in terms of what they've done in the space. Um, now, uh, let, let me ask Pat, uh, I, it, it sounds like everything is really exciting there in that world. But in terms of, of the uh, of the regulations right now, any anything going on right now, Pat, in the, uh, from from within the regulators and in actually easing out uh, on on the easing the rules on on the, the whole world of cryptocurrency slash uh, NFTs? Uh, no, short answer. Uh, it's a very gray area. Uh, it continues to be. I don't expect clarity for some time because of what's uh, going on in Congress right now in regards to other priorities. There was a hearing, the Financial Services Committee uh, had a hearing yesterday, it made a lot of news. There were uh, six crypto companies there, um, some of which like FTX heavily involved in the NFT space. Um, the reception seemed to be very good in regards to the questioning, but you know we've all been through this before in regards to how quickly uh, Congress works and it takes time. Um, the regulators are um, uh, regulating by enforcement and uh, I would expect a lot of enforcement actions to continue to come out um, in the crypto space, some of which includes NFTs. Uh, a number of companies over the last several months, similar to what occurred two years ago, last year have received letters from the SEC regarding their operations, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this regulation by enforcement and uh, well, you know, our, our estimation will continue, um, but it is heading in the right direction uh, because um, two years ago for, for someone to tell me that Congress was going to have a, a hearing that Bloomberg would be covering live regarding uh, regarding um, the crypto space um, and that crypto overall was over $2 trillion in size, $3 trillion, sorry, I, 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 I must have grown a lot since last week, I apologize, but uh, $3 trillion in size, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't have expected that, so, uh, so it, it's going to be a bumpy ride, we're ready for it, we're regulatory and compliance forward, we're looking at a, a lot of different avenues as a broker-dealer and an ATS in regards to what we can list we're thinking about DeFi. We have a lot of approvals in place, um, but from a regulatory standpoint, um, there's, you know, the clarity won't be there for some time. So, so Nisa, are, are you right now? So, so you're 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 like uh, the biggest interest right now is is to to, to raise the uh, new um, to 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 get the, your new fund closed, and, and that's that's. Your, your your primary goal for 2022 or what what what's yeah i 
mean, we continue to fund companies um, at the early stage primarily. Um, and so Seed Series A, uh, we're always looking for great founders to buy. And and then and another question. Uh, and then your previous uh, funds, do they still have a dry powder? I mean, are you investing uh, st still in in the in the space? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then what will be the the, the qualifier? I mean, what what, uh, what what areas of the NFTs? The infrastructure is you you mentioned that that's the the most interested subject or 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 the. Or, or the actual token themselves. I mean, has anybody approached you and say, hey, I want to uh, do the token and I have a great idea, but I don't know how to make this thing happen? Or how does that work? Actually, they're a little bit further along the idea stage, but yeah, I mean, we, we invest in equity, we invest in tokens, and um, as I mentioned, not only NFT infrastructure, but DeFi and gaming and and you know, some CFI infrastructure as well. So there's a lot of different areas. How much are you raising? And what, what's what's your what's your sweet spot uh, in 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 investment? Um, we've done a lot of early stage DeFi over the past couple of years, like you know, Maker and Compound and DYDX and Near Protocol and a lot of very deep technical. Mm -hmm. But but what's what's the what's the you know what what is the round looking looking like? Do they invest like two or five million dollars or what's the what's the what what's the what, what's this? Okay, and what's your seat, sweet spot in, for the investments? There is no sweet spot. It depends deal by deal. Okay, sounds sounds interesting. Uh, I'm going to. I have a question for any for any So um, what what was the size of fund one? Fund one was 100 million, fund two is 250. This one's about 60. Great, okay. And what was the return on the last two funds? Fund one did about 11.5 uh, X MOIC, and fund two is about 4.5 X so far. Thank you. Okay, your turn. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I was, I was just going to, uh, um, uh, to, to ask uh, Jeremy a question in, in the terms of, of uh, what uh, what is the like the the, the the project the size of the project that he's he's expecting as as the as the inflow from the deal I mean from from the deal flow pros perspective what what sort of projects he he looks uh, out there in the world I think Jeremy dropped off because he's up in his car oh uh, okay okay well never mind that. Uh, I've already uh, asked that to Nisa, so so I guess Pat is not going to tell us because he's he's more in the regulation. But but I just wanted to 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 educate myself uh, and an audience on, on figuring out, you know, what really gets funded and at what stages of of the of the actual projects are uh, are being funded uh, by uh, by you know family offices or or VCs and uh, and such. But let's just let let just move on in the terms of the uh, uh, with the, with the cryptocurrency because it's it's a very volatile as we as we know it. Uh, any prediction uh, from you, Pat, in terms of the stability of the Bitcoin right now? Uh, what what's going to happen next year? Uh, are we going to see increase or decrease? And then I, I know that this is like a looking into the crystal ball <laughs> for pretty much everybody. But 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 you know realistically. How are you perceiving the, you know, the, the future of 2022 in terms of the cryptocurrency as the whole uh, area, you know, including or including the NFTs? Yeah. So, um, so I'm a banker by background, and I've seen uh, we're we're uh, doing a capital raise, another capital raise right now. Uh, Maker is major investor, and uh, they uh, they've led our next round as well. And the players around the table right now are primarily uh, a combination of traditional and DeFi. And by traditional household names you would recognize here, um, they are getting into the space. We're TradFi, CFi, the DeFi. We're a bridge. We're the bridge, we'd like to say. And we, um, so from uh, the traditional world moving into crypto, 
Uh, it's like a tidal wave right now. So I, I think that as I look at that, um, that uh, in, we talked about regulation a bit uh, as well, that it's a, it's a ways off, but regulation will be eventually come into play that, you know, this is a, a, this market's not going away. Um, Three trillion in size. But if you're an investor and you've never been involved in this space before, my suggestion would be NFTs are collectibles. So approach it that way at this point in time. Uh, and with any collectible, uh, you, uh, it's less about uh, appreciation and more about why it's a collectible to you and the importance to you. That, that's the first and foremost that I'd share. Um, secondarily, Bitcoin and ETH, everything seems to trade. I mean, they're always um, outliers, but Bitcoin and ETH, if you're getting into this space, are probably the areas I would focus on. Uh, they're very different, and uh, I would dive deep to understand, what, you know, the differences. But but um, I'm more excited about ETH in the long term play because so many uh, DApps or applications are built on ETH, whereas with Bitcoin, it is a uh, store of value. So there's a lot of um, uh, upside, in my opinion, with ETH. But you can easily expand that into all the other protocols: Avalanche, Solana. Uh, Cardano, um, you know, they're all very exciting in regards to where they're going. So now with all that said, uh, Bitcoin two weeks ago was at 69 or three weeks ago and got as low as 41. Uh, I think I heard, uh, well, I read something that suggested out in Asia on some, one of the smaller exchanges, Bitcoin, uh, there was a trade at 32. Uh, this is very volatile, high risk. But if you have a long-term view, and I would, I would, I would say the same with NFTs, that uh, overall you should do well. But you, you should have a very long-term view. Uh, or, right, I, I have a, a statement and maybe a question on this. So, is anyone considering that all of these NFT asset-backed NFTs, uh, maybe this is up Pat's alley, are, are going to really impact the ability for uh, retail investors to get into the product they couldn't get into in the past? So, for example, you know, if you invested in a REIT or a real estate fund, you might be able to get part of a large office building in New York City or Chicago. But now, if it's NF, if it's token back, many people can pour into that and own their piece of the Empire State Building. Let's say. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So I did um, the first of that kind of deal about four years ago. Uh, it was a hotel, uh, St. Regis, actually. Um, so I own a piece of it. After my one-year lockup, it trades on an exchange, and um, you still need to be an accredited investor to have access, at least right now. Um, that definition is expanding, though. Um, so more and more real assets will continue to be tokenized and have since then. And so I think that um, it's great for democratizing access to capital and also you know to people to getting in on these deals that they were traditionally shut out of and that happened before nfts were even a thing it's something called security tokens and they're registered they're they're legal and something what's, it, what's interesting is that before 2000 in the the old uh, internet stock market crash that was the tradition was that things like this would get out into the market the the retail investor could buy them etc and then you know Regulations change, etc. So maybe so we're kind of heading back to where we were. Or but maybe Pat, you can also get some perspective because I mean, somebody said yesterday that even if everybody becomes tokenized, they still need market makers right. to right. sell them and make people yes. aware of brand, etc. Can you talk yeah, about that? It, it, exactly, and I agree with uh, with Lisa's comments completely. Fractionalization will allow the democratization for investors and more diver diversification for the smaller investors. Um, Regarding market makers, so you know that's a real problem uh, in this space. There are other ATSs that have here in the U.S. come out, and it, you know, frankly, uh, in their equities, we're we're focused on it, um, it, um, certain types of equities like REITs, but really structured products because we think there's a a, a lot of advantages to that. Um, but they're not trading because there's a lack of market makers. Uh, the crypto market makers are really arbitrageurs. 
uh, and they're what created the space to date and create a lot of that liquidity in these variety of prices and, and volatility. Uh, that is not the security token space yet. And uh, we're working hard to bring that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a nation market. Eventually, there'll be a tipping point. That tipping point will be a, a brand name like what's occurred in, in a way in the NFT space with marketing companies. And uh, when you start seeing that, I think the market makers will, will come along. We've been having discussions with all the, there are three major market makers in, here in the US. We've spoken all three many, many times. We've spoken to the top crypto market makers. They know this is coming, but uh, we're not, you know, today it's not, uh, they're, they're not in this market because frankly, the NFT market and the crypto market, uh, they're making huge amounts of profit and that's where their focus is. But eventually it will cross over. Uh, and another question, Lisa, how, how, how is the St. Regis token? Has the value gone up? Up 30%. So, yeah, that was my question is whether, because a lot of real estate guys here, yeah. whether or not tokenization of assets will lead to real optimization of pricing, right? Yeah, and, and the I, other thing that's interesting there is that it's partially also a utility token in that you can stay there and get benefits. You get cash back, you can get loyalty points, you can get free things. So there's this like hybrid that was never possible before in traditional finance. Um, Mar Marty, do, do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Are we, uh, are we actually, you asked the question last time. Yeah, it's, um, it's just about the uh, Bloomberg article on Tether and like what's actually behind it. And that uh, people seem to be just saying, okay, and it's ever forward. And you guys have thoughts on that? I, I didn't see the Bloomberg question. article, but I mean, the conversation around Tether has been primarily whether or not um, it is actually been transparent as to what's backing it. Exactly. Um, and it's been a stable coin that's facilitated a lot of the activity in DeFi, et cetera. So it's grown tremendously. Um, and so I think that's, you know, part of what regulators are still grappling with is, um, you know, part of this stable coin. Um, there's a hearing next week just on stable coin actually and how to regulate them so I, I, that's a whole other panel that we can get into yeah um just to add to that so so um there's a question as to whether stable coins are money market funds uh and uh that's part of the hearing next week <clears throat> the um uh, tether um the suggestion is that tether invest it has invested uh, because they haven't been transparent in Chinese securities. Uh, Evergrande, which is in default, and others. Um, now, uh, the, uh, the Senate Banking Committee a couple of weeks ago sent a letter to Tether regarding uh, a, um, a, a request to understand their underlying holdings. I'm not quite sure if they responded as of yet. <coughs> they haven't responded. Um, so there's a question there. So Tether, um, you know, te Tether's had a, a bit of a checkered history. They paid a fine here in New York uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I think that was settled about a year and a half ago. And, uh, but that was at, on the state level. And uh, now the federal government, uh, the uh, regulators are uh, going after them to, to understand better what they have and frankly, what the risks are. The risk with Tether is that, um, that if they're holding um, riskier assets, since it's, a, it's the largest stable coin at this point in time, that there could be a run if, uh, if, if, um, if uh, that was the case. Currently, from a transparency standpoint, that's, that needs to be clarified. Tender itself is, has, uh, has stated that they're investing in high-grade uh, uh, investment uh, vehicles. So um, we'll, we'll see where that goes. The other stable coins, for the most part, like USDC, et cetera, they, they're much more transparent. Thank you. And traditionally backed by the dollar or treasuries. Great. Um, I think we have a couple of more minutes to just uh, wrap it up the panel. And 
and any any thoughts uh, from you, Nisa, on on the on it like 2020? What's what your what? Where is your energy? I understand that you're raising another fund, um, but uh, but just like how, what? Do you, how do you see the 2020 in, in the crypto and an NFT? 22. Hey, I'm <laughs> lost too. I mean, obviously, I wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't bullish um, on where things are going. Um, I think it's really like almost like a renaissance. It's a transformative time because we're actually going from Web 2 to Web 3. And instead of us being the product as we were in Web 2 and having you know a few companies control that, we're taking back our ownership in Web 3 and participating in it through tokenization. And that's going to open up things we can't even imagine right now. Mm -hmm. Ask you a question. Have you done any work of Orchid Labs, Steve Waterhouse? No. Okay, because they were big into Web3 years ago, and I think that's a, that was a big thing then, so, okay. Yeah, the Web3 is kind of floating right now, the definition, I suppose, but but I, uh, yeah, I, I understand that the, the, the actual security of the protocols and and individuality is the the next big thing uh, for for the web, which will enable the all of the NFTs and and the cyber. Sorry about that. Be able to uh, uh, to, to to exist, uh, so to speak. But anyways, uh, Pat, uh, just to summary. Uh, I, I, I had a question. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> and I had a question. I found myself where there was all the conference rooms were picked up, so I went to the main lobby and. I'm sitting by the door, so um, I apologize. But anyways, Pat, any any summaries uh, for for the panel? I, I had a question for Pat. So, so Pat, you know, you're in the market right now. Can you talk about your firm, intellectual property, strategic sure. advantage you might have, where you're placed in the whole universe of ATS, etc. Sure. Thank you, Marty. Um, yeah. So, so we're a broker dealer, Oasis Pro Markets. We have an ATS. Uh, again, we. We, uh, it, uh, to our knowledge, are the only ones approved for digital securities for digital cash uh, transactions or payments, and uh, which means atomic swaps. So T plus two on our APS is non-existent. It's actually T plus zero, and uh, which is exciting. And there's almost zero counterparty risk, reduced costs, uh, transparencies. Transparency. We're off chain up until the uh, transaction is consummated, and that, and then it goes on chain. We work across all protocols, and in the space we're in right now, um, we're uh, focused on structured products. Uh, we're focused on equities, dividend-paying instruments. Uh, we're uh, soon, soon we'll be having an announcement regarding NFTs, real-world asset NFTs. Um, we're very focused on yield products as well, and um, the benefits of, um, of working with us, and, and again, I mentioned all these uh, institutional groups out there, is that uh, we have a really strong team. We've got a major DeFi player as a backer and on our board, and uh, we, uh, we really have come, uh, come to this from a Wall Street standpoint. A lot of our guys have a tremendous Wall Street experience. Um, and uh, we also have the chops on the blockchain DeFi side through uh, MakerDAO. And uh, we have a tremendous amount of uh, advisors who used to be developers and smart contract, uh, uh, smart contract leads at uh, MakerDAO, as well as other uh, DeFi projects. So we, we're very unique and uh, we're really thinking about this whole DeFi space um, and in regards to uh, it's not just taking the uh, public markets, the electronic markets, and putting it on the blockchain, which some others are doing. And uh, that's an evolution of technology. We're about that plus DeFi. And we really didn't talk about DeFi in, in, in real depth today, but there's a tremendous amount of uh, disintermediation opportunities in DeFi that we plan to uh, bring, bring to our ATS. Fantastic. Great job, guys. Thanks so much. Okay.